Banners matter. Banners matter. You've heard black lives matter. You've heard blue lives matter. You've heard all lives matter. And every one of those statements are true. I disagree with the organization because it doesn't adhere to biblical principles and is founded by uh, women who do not believe in the family as God constructed it, according to them. They are trained Marxists, and nobody was a bigger racist than Karl Marx. Karl Marx thought nothing of black people. So that you have black Marxists trying to march in the name of black people. You call yourself a Marxist. You ought to, call, you ought to just go, and, go ahead and call yourself a Klansman because Karl Marx thought just as little of black people as the Klan did and does. And yet the women who have started Black Lives Matter, the organization, they are self-professed Marxists. Look them up, they'll tell you. Some of us just don't know what it means because you know they, 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 they count on our people uh, being ignorant and not investigating a thing. That might be why people like Trayvon Martin's parents and others are calling the organization a sham and a con. That might be why some blacks are suing it. Because with all the money that they've raised, they haven't given any to HBCUs. They haven't given any to help struggling black businesses. And when they finally move on from a city after they have torn it down, they don't send any money back to help any of the businesses. And by the way, um, do you not know that back during the summer when they had all of the riots, I just thought I would just throw this in. When they had all of the riots, and um, of course they are, they're forgiving all of the people who, who did that now. And, uh, but when they had all of the riots, do you not know most of those riots were held in opportunity zones? You know what those opportunity zones were? They were zones that were created by the Trump administration that would put money into the black community to build black businesses. So a lot of businesses sprung up in the opportunity zones. Black Lives Matter came and marched in the opportunity zones, tore up the businesses, ransacked the businesses, the businesses lost money, the businesses went out of business, the businesses were burned down, and those business owners, because they didn't have the money that they needed, end up selling the land and those places right back to the white man. But all of this was done to us in the name of, and with the media helping them, helping us, because these people care about us when they actually just gut punched us. All of those businesses. Look up, look up, look it up and see where most of those riots were. They were in black areas. All of those businesses gone. All that black wealth and potential wealth gone. And the people who did it, to show that it really didn't matter, the attorneys, generals, and people like that now have decided, ah, we're not going to press charges. But if you were part of the crowd that stormed the Capitol, you're still in jail. And they said that those people tried to take over the government. Nobody's going to try to take over the government unarmed. That ain't going to happen. And if you go back and you listen, you watch half the tapes, you see many of them, and I'm glad I wasn't there, but you see many of them, the, 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 the officers were, were beckoning them to come in. They said, come on in. Well, they, they, they went in. Yeah. It was a mess. I'm glad I was in my office that day. Someone kept calling me. He said, are you watching television? I said, I don't have a television in my office. But I'm getting off into the weeds. The point is, all of those gains, 
that we had in businesses. See, you want business. That's how you create long time wealth. That's how, you know, you get old money. You grow businesses. Amen. And uh, they're all gone. So you've heard about uh, Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, Your Life Matter, My Life Matter. Well, I want to preach Banners Matter. Banners Matter. Father, bless me now as I preach the word of the Lord. I pray, God, that you open the ears of the listeners, whether they're here live in the sanctuary or watching us uh, through the miracle of this, the internet, and however they are watching us, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, however, let the word of the Lord sink deep. When they see this on television or they hear us on radio, may the word of the Lord sink deep into their spirits. In Jesus' name, amen. In this last month, last Sunday, excuse me, of the month of June, the last Sunday of what we proclaim here at the Upper Room Church of God in Christ as Jesus Pride Month. This was a, a vision that the Lord gave me. Um, the question is, as we celebrate the last Sunday of Jesus Pride Month, here's the question. Why do this? Wouldn't what are you people at Upper Room doing now? Why? Have a Jesus Pride Month. You've already admitted that you put it in place to coordinate with LBGTQ plus people proclaiming June as Pride Month. So you come up with Jesus Pride Month at the same time. Well, at least I didn't lie about it. I did tell you why I did it. But the question is, why? And I think that that is a reasonable question. Um, but most people won't ask you. <laughs> They'll ask everyone else but you. So I will ask and answer the question. And it will help some of you. You love me. You love the church. But you may not understand why we do this. And I understand at times why you don't understand. But the answer is found in the scriptures. I believe that we ought to have Bible for everything that we do. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. That's 1 Corinthians Chapter 15 and verse 33. Evil communications. The word communication comes from a Greek word. The word is homilia. Homilia means to converse, to talk. Originally, the word meant being together in company, companionship. But in the New Testament, it means, first and foremost, conversation, homilia, an English word that is derived from homilia is the word, we preachers know it, homiletic, and homiletic pertains to the art of preaching. Another word, preachers, that we are familiar with is the word homily. A homily is a discourse, and yet another word is the word homilist. The homilist is one who writes or delivers Homilies. First Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33 tells us what is communicated with us has an effect on us. It says, be not deceived. Evil, I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me. Evil communications corrupt good manners. The word corrupt literally means to destroy, to punish, to bring to a worse state, to spoil. Evil communications spoils, they destroy 
they waste good manners. Manners, the Greek word is ethos. Ethos is our habits, customs, morals, character. Ethos gives us the English word ethics. Ethics are uh, the study of the way things ought to be. So the writer is saying that what is communicated to us has an effect on us. The, if, if, if the, the communication is positive, then it affects us in a positive way. If the communication is negative, then it affects us in a negative way. And the warning is to everyone. It says to everyone, be not deceived. Doesn't matter who it is, whether it's you or me. Doesn't matter how educated you are, how strong you are, how weak you are, how well-versed you may be. Evil communication corrupts good manners. So the question is, what has been communicated with us or to us through the month of June? Really all 12 months. But what have we been told for the, uh, throughout the duration of this month? We've been told that LBGTQ plus is good. It's moral and it's right. We've been told that people who are in that community and when they come out, they are courageous. They're brave and they're bold. Somehow or another, um, during the Obama administration, when a basketball player came out and uh, said that he was uh, homosexual, Obama invited him to the gallery of the White House to sit in the gallery um, beside the first lady. Man, seven feet tall. I know a man seven feet tall could be funny. Se I didn't. Seven feet. You, you way up there. And uh, President Obama said publicly to the man, said, well, I want you to know, me and Michelle, we have your back. And they invited him to sit in the gallery of the, of the, the Capitol Rotunda and to sit there doing the State of the Union address and he was called courageous for coming out and admitting that he likes, he prefers having sex with men. What is being told to us? What is being communicated? Trans people have the right to be who they truly are. We're being told that lie while trans people work hard to become someone else. I'm going to, I got news for you, earth to you. You are who you truly are. You don't need surgery to become who you truly are. You, don't, you cutting off your breasts or cutting off your family or allowing yourself to be cut into doesn't make you who you truly are. Birth makes you who you truly are. Do you know that was a push one time to get the doctors and the nurses to stop announcing it? When the baby's first born, it's a boy, it's a girl. Cut that out. Says, and wait until the child gets old enough to decide who and what they are. This is what's been told to us. And you know, they say trans people have a right to be who they truly are. And that, that right exists, uh, of, uh, uh, of course, unless they, uh, they get sick and they need treatment that, um, that uh, differs based on gender. Because he can call himself a woman all he wants. He can be a man, call himself a trans woman all he wants. And so he's got his artificial boobs put in up here, but he's trans. And uh, he's, he's the way God made him down there. But I guarantee you this, if he develops testicular cancer, they ain't going to treat him like he's a woman. 
Because women don't have testicles. What you gonna do with that? And she can try to be a man all she wants to, but if she develops ovarian cancer, laying there with ovaries and a beard, you can have removed whatever you want. When they treat you, John, <laughs> I got to get a new name. Mark, Mark. Thank you, John. Mark, when they treat you. See, you, you have to laugh at the absurd things that have been told to us. And again, one of the reasons this ministry try, tends to rub people the wrong way is I say things to you that you don't hear anywhere else. You're certainly not going to hear it from Don Lemon on CNN and Anderson Cooper, which is that's mainly what black folk love to watch, and Rachel Maddox on MSNBC, and come to church, and here stands a preacher who's still dumb enough to believe that you are who God made you to be and will not for a minute buy the lie that they're trying to sell. One of uh, a friend of mine um, was treating a patient and the patient wanted to be recognized as a he. And uh, she, I won't say what hospital and all that, because you never know who's watching, but uh, uh, they said to her, uh, stop referring to uh, her as a she, refer to her as a he. I'm getting confused myself. And, uh, and, and, and she said, as long as she's laying there with ovaries, that's a woman. I don't care what he, uh, she chooses to call herself. And notice the hypocrisy. Now, do you all remember that white girl named Rachel Delazar? Rachel tried to, a white girl, Rachel tried to pretend to be black. Rachel braided her hair. Rachel got a tan. Looked like a black girl to me, you know. And Rachel's parents came out. And mama, da mama and daddy white. They said, no, we birthed her. Look at her dad, pale white. Mama, white. They said, she's white. The NAACP and everybody turned on her. Now, why is it that we believe that a man can turn himself into a woman and we would, we would go along with that, but we wouldn't let a white woman turn herself into a black girl? Now, it seemed to me that would be easier. And you know old Jackson tried, old Michael, he, he <laughs> tried hard. I'm making someone mad. But I'm not being absurd. I'm, I'm showing you the absurdities that they want you to believe. We have made up nonsensical terms like biological male and biological female. These are nonsensical terms because it implies that there is another kind of male or female. Can there be any other male, kind of male, than one who was born male? No, no. So when you buy these terms, what they're asking you to do is to look at a man and say, okay, I understand you're a biological male, but if you want to be a female, we'll go along with it. Uh, MasterCard has just put out a dumb uh, commercial, the dumbest one ever. I started to show it. The dumbest one ever. They're showing that they're, they're defending trans people and they're saying trans people have a right to make purchases without being judged or harmed or beaten. So when a trans person comes and they make a purchase and they present a card, if that the name on the card doesn't match the identity, match who and what they look like, no one should judge them. So, that being said, if, you, if somebody steals your credit card and go and, and get five flat screens, let's see, get someone's uh, credit card like Brother People's, buy three cars, <laughs> and then present the card, and the card says Ron People's, 
but they're looking at someone who look like you should call them at worst Rhonda peoples. That the person receiving the card shouldn't have any suspicions whatsoever. Now if you buy that, you're talking about thief. Thievery. The person can look like anybody. Man walk up to looking just like me and, and hand him a card. Or, or someone looking just like that sister right there and hand him a card. And, but the card says Opie. There ain't no sister named Opie. Opie Taylor. Say, where you from? Mayberry. <laughs> and, and, and no one is supposed to be suspicious. This is absurd. But this is what's being told to us as wisdom and, and new uh, common sense. For years, we've been lied to and told that there was such a thing as a gay, I don't call them gay, but a gay gene. Only until they discovered that there is no such thing in existence. And then when they did the article saying that, uh, that, that there was no such thing as a gay gene, the headlines read, actually, gay gene discovered. But what they were counting on, and, they, and, they, and, they, and their calculations were correct, they were counting on people not reading the article. All you got to do is just hide it, put it in the third paragraph, because we're not going to read any. We might read one paragraph, but we're not going to read the whole article. And they count on people being ignorant. In this day and time, ignorance can get you killed. It can, it can mess you up. They're using terms. Are you praying for me? They're using terms that have been focus group tested, such as LBGTQ rights. This implies that someone is being denied something that is rightfully theirs, such as the right to marry. The reason we oppose same-sex marriage is that words have meaning. The definition of marriage has been a union between a man and a woman since the beginning of time. That's it. That's what a marriage is, a union between a man and a woman. Now, what, they, what the LBGTQ people wanted was special rights. Though the, and these special rights would allow them to redefine what marriage is. We oppose it. The definition of marriage was, is older than the Constitution of the United States of America. All of the major world religions all agreed on the definition of marriage. And in just a few years ago, the Supreme Court redefined marriage. And, they, and here's what their argument, they did it under the 14th Amendment, uh, the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, and they said that people should be allowed to marry who they love. Where is that written? If a thing is a right, where is it written? What document? What book? What set of rules says that it's a right? Does it become a right because you say it's a right? No, it was a made up right. Never have men even wanted to marry men. Nor women wanted to marry women. But they use rights and, and, and it really got to us because as a people, we have been denied. We have been discriminated against in this country. We know what it is to suffer and not being treated fairly. And so what they did was they played on our emotions. And all of a sudden the black person said, well, you know, I'm black. I know what it is to be discriminated against. So I don't think that we should discriminate against anybody. Discrimination in and of itself is not a bad thing. It depends on why you discriminate. To discriminate literally means to discern. You got to know the meaning of the word. To discern. To choose between. And one of the things you don't want to do is lose your ability to discern. Yeah. Jesus warned that in the last days, spirits of deception would be in the land. And that one of the things that protects you is your ability to discern. What is discern? To decide the difference between. To decide the difference between right and wrong. 
what's good and what's bad. When you lose the ability to discern, you're in trouble. You become a sitting duck to, to any and everything that comes along. Have you noticed that they have linked this month, Juneteenth, uh, the, 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 the month that celebrates when the, the slaves in uh, 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 Austin, Texas, got the word that they were free. Uh, 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 two years uh, later, am I right about that? When the word arrived to them, uh, two years or so after the slaves had been freed, and I, and I think that's, that's worthy of a celebration. But notice how the media, I saw a commercial on A&E television the other day, they've linked Juneteenth to Pride Month. So they're linking all the things that affect us, black folk, to LBGTQ. And the B in the LBGTQ is not black. The B stands for bisexual, not black folk. And I, I resent, I resent as a proud African-American male, I resent with every fiber, uh, fiber of my being, fiber of my being, this attempt to equate blackness with perversion. Would you show the first slide, please? The change took place with us when President Obama became president. Newsweek declared President Obama as being America's first homosexual president. Look at this. Look at the, look at the caption there. Look at the, the halo. This is Newsweek. The first, I don't call him gay, but gay president. Now, um, thank you so much. Now, here's what's sad. I don't know how President Obama felt about that. Do you? That's the problem. Did you hear from the White House? Did you hear? I tell you what, had they called me the first uh, uh, homosexual anything, it would have been everywhere. That's a lie. Amen. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. All that church talk, loose here, devil. All that. I, I would have let people know that that is not who I am. Why didn't we hear from him? Why? And in not hearing from him, the shift began to take place in our thinking. Preachers had to, in order to be loyal because of superficial considerations like color, preachers had to change their tone and soften their tone. And when he came out in support of same-sex marriages, that was it. That was it. Ever since then, our people have taken a different stance when it comes to things like this. Whether it is the NBA, the NFL, Major League Soccer, no point in even mentioning the uh, WNBA. It's just messed up. Female golf, tennis, even the whole sports world pushes lesbianism. The entertainment industry, the news networks, social media, the music industry. We are being bombarded with the message that calls this lifestyle right, moral, and good. Now remember, evil communications corrupts good manners. So what are we being told day in and day out? Whether you're trying to watch a football game, a basketball game. Uh, I know you Raiders fans are bent, twisted in, like a pretzel. Oh, that defensive end for the Raiders came out. Big man like that. Big man like that came out and says, uh, I like having sex with men. That's a disgrace. We're being told that this lifestyle is good and right. I actually don't call it a lifestyle. I call it a death style. Uh, because why, why, why you ask? I'm not trying to, I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to say anything for shock value. I'm saying it because it's so. If everybody practiced it, it would mean the extermination of the human race in less than 100, 100 years. If every man went homosexual and every woman went lesbian, the human race would die. Well, why would it die, Reverend? Because with all due respect, saliva doesn't germinate and brothers, babies don't come from there.
Some of y'all will get that Monday of 2022. The truth is, homosexualism cannot exist without some form of heterosexualism. Conversely, heterosexualism would get along just fine and would thrive even better without any form of homosexualism. That's the truth. And there is much more. As we are bombarded with the message that evil is good, from the White House and in some cases from the church house. I saw a man yesterday, I was sent a, a, a caption, I started to show it to you, but I said no. Where he puts in front of his church, even Jesus had two daddies. And he's celebrating Pride Month. Now this is a preacher. Now you know you got to be messed up. It's the only a messed up minded man. Uh, would even say uh, something like that. Well, what got him that way is being bombarded right. with the message, the message that evil is good. The Bible tells us it corrupts good manners. It affects our ethics, our ethos. It affects the way we think, what we believe, and how we behave. Second Peter chapter number 2, verse 7 through 8. Are you praying for me today? Please hear this today. When I'm telling you today, you won't hardly hear anywhere else. Second Peter chapter number two, verse seven says, and delivered just lot. That is, God delivered righteous lot. Not just as in only, but just as in righteous. Righteous lot vexed with the filthy, here's that word again, conversation of the wicked. Parenthetically, for that righteous man dwelling among them, look at this, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day by their unlawful deeds. Lot hanging, living in Sodom and living in Gomorrah. The Bible teaches that in just seeing the way they live and hearing them, or watching them interact, there is no scriptural evidence whatsoever that Lot ever participated in homosexuality. But by living with them, the Bible says it vexed him. And, and, and the Bible actually shows the effects of his vexation. And I see the effects of Lot's vexations today. One of the things that it did, it robbed Lot of a sense of divine urgency. The angels came and told him, listen, God's getting ready to destroy this city. We got to get out of here. Man, Lot and his family, they're taking the time packing everything. Somebody stopped packing and said, I want to get some coffee. Someone else said, I want to take a nap. No sense of urgency whatsoever. The angels said, did y'all hear me? God is getting ready to destroy this city. Oh, we got time. The angels had to grab him. And said, look, we got to go. Look at how the churches have lost their sense of urgency. A lot of churches today are still closed. Still closed. No sense of urgency. Uh, no righteous indignation. Seeing the sin don't make them upset. And I'll tell you another way it destroyed his family. In watching them, it messed up his daughters. They lost their ability to judge. They lost their ability to discern. For Lot had two daughters and both of his daughters were virgins. But the text tells us that Lot had two sons-in-law. So the girls, they, they couldn't discern. Married homosexuals. And the men didn't touch them. Now I can imagine on that honeymoon night, the girl was laying in the bed saying, uh, uh, Honey, are you coming to bed? And he's in the bathroom. Be there in a minute. I'll be out in a minute. You know, usually the man is waiting on, you know, on that night, you know. He's all jacked up. He's ready. <laughs> Just <laughs> imagining what's getting ready to happen next. Got, got his bride and oh, and made it to the uh, bed chamber and in the hotel. And tonight's the night. You belong to me. And she's in there 
getting ready. I'll be out in a minute, honey. You know, then she step out and, you know. Amen. <laughs> Ain't nothing left but love and happiness. <laughs> Am I right about it? But in Lot's daughter's case, they land there. Will you please come on? The man wouldn't come out the bathroom. After a while, the girls fell asleep. You know why? He didn't, they didn't want them. Didn't find them attractive. Found them to be dirty. Be careful, ladies, who you marry. When a man's mind is perverted, he'll have you taking a shower five times a day. When there's nothing wrong with you, there's nothing wrong with your scent. There's nothing wrong with you as a woman. But he will do an okey-doke on your mind. Because the truth is, it ain't you, it's him. And he's got a spirit in him. And he needs to be delivered. He will destroy your self-esteem. He will make you think you're ugly. He will make you think that there's something wrong with you. Have you thinking that you smell? Oh, and you, you're about to just destroy yourself. Got you washing your body with Lysol. Because you think there's something wrong with you. When you married someone, that discernment, had you just been a member of Upper Room and listened to me, discernment would have told you, don't mess with him. Because you'll never be able to convert him. Oh, but Bishop, wouldn't you? You don't know about this him. I got mine so good it can change anybody. Not if the man don't want it. Not if he don't want it. A many, a many have wasted their lives trying. Amen. So his daughters was messed up. And not only were they messed up, but they, they, they got their moral compass. Compass went bad. Because you know what they did? They, had, they got their daddy drunk and had sex with him. Incest. All this came from evil communications. Evil communications corrupted their good manners. As we see, just bear with me for a few more minutes. As we see denominations after, denom after denominations taking down. As we see same-sex messages. They, uh, they, are, they are preached to us. Yes, they're sung to us, they're beamed to us, suggested to us, rammed down our throats. If there is no counter message, if there is nothing or little said from our pulpits, then that evil communication will indeed corrupt our good manner. And you have to admit, very few churches and preachers are saying something. While on the other hand, uh, the world is just pushing this agenda. Just pushing it to us. Another question that is asked, are you praying for me? Is why deal with this? Aren't we supposed to preach the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? After all, didn't Jesus say, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Yes, he said it. And I'll tell you why he said it. He said it in Mark 16 and 15. And we do preach the gospel. And we are. And we shall. In addition, though, to preaching the gospel, and some actually try to limit the gospel to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and to the four gospels when Jesus himself talked about more than his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's not all he preached. That's not all he talked about. Am I right? We're also told in the Bible, Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, Paul says, preach the word. Now, when Paul wrote 2 Timothy chapter 2, it is doubtful. Well, first of all, most of what we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, many of those books had not been written when Paul wrote, preached the word. And also, 
for those that did exist, there's not hard evidence that he read them. Because remember, there was no internet. There was no mass communications. The, the way that you transport a, 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 a letter is you write it on the paper and give it to somebody, and that one person have that one letter, and they take it to the people and uh, read it, and then you got to take it somewhere else and take it somewhere else. So when Paul said, preach the word, the only word that was established, that was written at that time was the Old Testament. Where we find thou shalt not lay with mankind as with womankind. Where we find the Bible uh, uh, con condemning perversion completely. That was the word that Paul was referencing when he was talking to Timothy. For Paul had no idea that his letters, 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament, Paul had no way of knowing that his letters would ever be canonized into scripture. So he couldn't have been saying, preach the book of Galatians. He couldn't have been saying preach the book of Philippians. He couldn't have been saying at the time preach uh, the book of, uh, of Romans because uh, 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 he had written those books by the time he wrote 2 Timothy, but he had written those books to those churches. He had no way of knowing that they would be canonized. And yet he says preach the word. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Oh my, the word comes, when he says preach the word, it comes from a Greek word, logos, which means the word of God, whether it is the law or not. Preach the word. Mark chapter 7, verse 13, we find Jesus saying this. He was rebuking the, the Pharisees and he says that you making the word of God of none effect through your traditions. When Jesus was referencing the word of God being made of none effect, Jesus was talking about the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament, the word of God. And Jesus calls the word of God, the Old Testament, the word of God. Now we know that the New Testament is the word of God also, but my point I'm making to you is at the time that they made these statements, the New Testament had not been written. It was being lived out and played out. And yet Christ, when he walked the earth, he called the Old Testament the word of God. Jesus said he also spoke of the word of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 13, read it when you get home, verse 19 through, through 23. He says from verse 19 through 23, he mentions the word of the kingdom. He mentions in verse 20, the word of God. In verse 22, the word of God. He mentions in verse 23, uh, anyone that hears the word, the word, the word. So we are called to preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but we're called to preach the full counsel of God's word. Mark 2 and 2 says, And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as even about the door. Speaking of Jesus, he says, And he preached the word unto them. The word, the word of God. Acts 8 and 4 says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Again, the word that existed that, uh, at the time was the Old Testament. The point is, the word is the whole Bible. And if we let them trick us into not preaching the whole Bible and let them tell us what part of the scriptures we can preach and can't preach, we're setting ourselves up to be victims of another gospel which is not the gospel. Do you, know, do you not know that there is such a thing as a queer Bible? They made up their own. And in their own Bible, they leave out. See, there's no point in going to buy it. They leave out certain portions of scripture. This is why we must preach the word and say something. Amen. Paul said this in Galatians chapter number one. Uh, amen. In verse 6 he says, I marvel that you were so soon removed from him that called you 
into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That, this is what's going on today. They're perverting the gospel of Christ and we're working with them by refusing to preach the whole counsel. We just preach those soft parts. We just preach the soft parts and we speak the truth in love and we dare not raise our voice. And while we're doing this, on the other hand, these people are trying to do to Christianity what we allow them to do to marriage and that is to redefine it. And in these homosexual churches, you can get saved in these churches. You can claim salvation in the name of Jesus. You're saved, but you don't have to quit being a homosexual. You're saved, but you don't have to quit being a lesbian or quit uh, walk out of trans, transgender lifestyle. You can be saved and keep all the sin. And, and so they're trying to redefine it. Now, if there is no pushback from the church, from the true church, then these doctrines and ideologies go unopposed and evil communications continues to corrupt our good manners. I hold that our good manners are being corrupted. I can tell by the response of people, how the responses have changed over the years. Uh, there was a time when you would preach on this subject and, and everybody would get with you and cheer you and say amen. Now you have to buy amen. You know why? Because sin in. The entertainment industry, or oh, in a big place, corporate America. Woo, corporate. And another cul culprit is biology. Many people have changed because of their son, or their daughter, or their grandchild, or their loved one. But let me tell you something. We don't get our morality from biology. We get our morality from the word of God. The Bible is right. Well, I got a friend. I don't care about your friend. I love your friend. But your friend, the Bible is still right. The Bible doesn't vary. It doesn't change because so-and-so is your friend. And if they were really your friend, you would point them to the scriptures. What kind of friend would let another friend go to hell and not even try to stop them? Let them go off the cliff in a lifestyle that's going to, that is going to destroy them. Even before age, the average lifespan was about 42 to 52 years. It's a lifestyle. Men weren't made to participate in things like that. And women were not either. <laughs> Lastly, and I'm going to get through this. You all, you're not doing like the 8 o'clock. The 8 o'clock uh, seemed to say amen a little more in this part right here. Amen. At 11 o'clock, y'all just looking at me. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay this out. And I know somebody always walk up to me and tell me after service, Bishop, when we're listening, we're, when we're quiet, we're just taking it in. We're listening. Well, keep on, keep on taking it in then. <laughs> but lastly, banners matter. Why do I do this? Banners matter. The God of the Bible made the rainbow. And it has a specific purpose, and it has a specific meaning. It speaks to us every time we see it. When he made it, he did not make it and leave it for us to assign meaning to it. Just like when he made the sun. Don't nobody try to call the sun anything else but the sun. They don't try to call the moon something else. But when it comes to this, we've tried to do something else with it. Make it uh, applicable to something that it is not applicable. It doesn't apply to it. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 13, God said, I do set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. When I bring a storm that the bow will be seen. And when it is seen, look at what God says. I will remember my covenant which is, be, which is between me and you and every living creature 
of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. The bowl shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it. And I, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh upon the earth. The rainbow has meaning. God assigned meaning to it. Now, there are people here. I'm going to give some of you an opportunity to do something that you would love to do, perhaps. I'm going to give you an opportunity to uh, embarrass me, shoot me down, reduce me to nothing as we're streaming. And uh, you can come on up here and try, but be ready. Based on the definitions that God gave to the rainbow he created. Can someone come up here and show me LBGTQ in this? I mean, come on, I, I, I'm open to all takers. Come and show me in these scriptures that I just read to you. When God said what he made the bow for. And God said, I made it for it to be a sign to you that no matter how much it's raining, I'm not going to ever flood the earth again. And I made it to be a sign to me that I made a covenant to you that I wouldn't let it happen again. And we live on the earth right now. There's enough water on the planet right now, right now to cover Mount Everest by at least 10 to 20 feet. It, ha it won't. Everest is the highest point on earth. It won't because God said to the waters, you'll never do it again. And that's why water is so pressurized. Submarines can't go but so deep. Humans can't go but so deep because God's word holds that water back. Every now and again, there's a tsunami. A tsunami. Every now and again, there's a flood. But it always recedes because God put that rainbow in the sky. Now, what gave man the right to take God's rainbow, which God said is a sign that he would never flood the earth again? When did we get the right to apply it to wicked behavior? Anybody want to come up here and show me? Come on. It's not in there. This is, this is man being man. Man doing things that he doesn't have a right to do. That we have, I'm going to preach in just a minute, I'm going to holler too. That we have set aside a month for people to proclaim that they live their lives in opposition to the Bible and are proud of it. Demands that those of us who live by the Bible believe the Bible and love the Bible it demands that we say something. The question then is not why am I talking about this. The question is why aren't other preachers? Why aren't all ministries talking about this? If you love the Bible, believe the Bible, and are living by the Bible, how then can they take this and misapply it and those of us who claim to believe the Bible, love the Bible, uh, live by the Bible, and claim to be Holy Ghost filled, how do we go through the month and we say nothing? Or if we do say something, it's a little tap on the wrist. Whereas they are spending billions in advertisements and in efforts to corrupt our minds, to change the way we think to make us accept that which the Bible condemns. I think it's time. I think it's high time that we say something. Let me preach our text and then we're going home. Everybody say amen. Our text begins with Israel Suffering a unprovoked attack. Israel had traveled to Rephidim. 
And they went there at the commandment of the Lord. According to verse 1, the B clause in this chapter, it says, according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. They visited Rephidim on their way to the land of promise. Would you show slide number one? Praise the Lord. Uh, they, they came from, they came from uh, uh, here. Goshen is where the Israelites lived while they were in Egypt. All the plagues was all over Egypt, but it never got to Goshen where God's people were. They got delivered. They left Egypt, crossed over this portion of the Red Sea, going down. Uh, this is the wilderness of uh, uh, the wilderness of sin right here, going down, and they go to Rephidim. You see there? This is where they were, led by the Lord. Show the next slide, please. Led by the Lord. And this is a little clearer. You see how they travel down. And while they were in Rephidim, they get an unprovoked attack by the Amalekites. Amalek uh, was the, the father of the Amalekites. These were trained warriors and soldiers, nomads. And they travel down and they attack Israel at Rephidim. Some two million people walking and they get attacked. Right here. And did I mention that it was an unprovoked attack? Now, they had walked uh, by now 46 days from Goshen to Rephidim, and they had traveled some 420 miles. And when they got there, according to the word, they had to end up traveling approximately another six miles to go to Mount Horeb. Because when they got to uh, Rephidim, there was no water. There was no water. And they, they were about to die of, of thirst. And I want you to show uh, slide number three. Because in verse six, this is where, this is where, look at this. This is where, this is the rock that Moses hit. See, in verse uh, number six, when there was no water, God tells Moses to travel about six more miles to go to Mount Horeb. He goes up to Mount Horeb and God speaks to Moses and Moses strikes the rock. Now what's interesting about what you're looking at, for a long time, the Christian community believed these passages, but they believed it by faith because the geologist said there's no proof that that rock existed. That's just like man. The, the problem was man was looking in the wrong place. So just because we couldn't find it on the Sinai Peninsula, we assumed it, did, it didn't exist. Well, it did exist right across the water in Saudi Arabia. The, Saudi, the Saudis will tell you this is where Moses were, and they have it fenced off. And if you go there and they catch you crossing that fence, you might not ever get back here. So you might want to just take my word for it. But this is the rock. Moses struck the rock. And what's interesting about this formation, these rocks right here, are on a, in an unnatural state. For it is unnatural for rocks to be smooth. Rocks are naturally jagged. You know why they were smooth? They're smooth because when the water gushed out, the torrents of the rocks, of the water, was so powerful. Because you're talking about about six, uh, two million people that he had to give water to. The water came out. It was so powerful that it literally smoothed the rocks. And that's evidence there of, of water pouring down. Well, there ain't no lake there. There's no lake. There's no ocean. So where did the water come from? The Bible tells us it came from the rock. It came from that rock. Go to the next slide. I want to just show you. And see, this is Mount Horeb or Sinai. Notice how black it is at the top of the mountain. Go to the next slide. Look at the top of the mountain. You see the blackness up there? Go to the next one. And look how dark it is up there. And the next one, please. And then, you know what that is? Remember, God came down on the top of Mount Sinai. He rested on Sinai and the whole mountain was on fire and it's right there in Saudi Arabia today the only mount up there with the black top like that 
where God came down. The evidence of God's truth is right there. Somebody ought to give God a hand. Moses went there. See, Moses went there and spake to that rock and God gave them water from the rock. Now in chapter 16, when they were going through the wilderness of sin, wilderness, the desert of sin, remember, it was there that they thirst. Because they weren't thirsty, they were hungry because they had no food. And God gave them quail. Well, in chapter 17, they have no water. And God gave them water from the rock. And uh, Amalek, the grandson, one of the grandsons of Esau, the father of the Amalekites, these men who were called enemies of Israel, gave Israel a un provoked attack are you praying for me and in verse 9 we see something that we uh, Joshua is introduced for the first time it says and Moses said unto Joshua choose us out men to go out and fight against Amalek and tomorrow I will stand uh, on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand now what is interesting about this Moses gives Joshua a death sentence without God. Because remember now, uh, Israel at this point, brothers and sisters, was 46 days out of slavery. They'd been in Egyptian bondage for 400 years. Slaves were not allowed to form armies. Slaves were not allowed to become soldiers. Slaves were not allowed to be trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They were slaves who had just been free, free for 46 days, and yet Moses tells Joshua, choose some men to go out and fight veteran fighters. Go out and fight folk who know how to fight. Amalek knows how to fight. That would be like someone asking me, handing me a, uh, a saxophone and telling me to outplay Brother Brian Miller, baddest saxophone player in the world. And here I am, I don't even know how, how to even blow in the thing. And I'm supposed to uh, uh, be able to play like him with no experience. And yet, when Moses gives Joshua this order, Joshua says, okay. Praise the Lord. And, uh, and then Moses says, I'm going to go up on the hilltop. And uh, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to pray. Now, what we see here, are you praying for me? We see a powerful picture of intercessory prayer coupled with human cooperation. So there's a lot of things God can do, but you got to cooperate. You know, we blame everybody else for our condition in life but ourselves. Well, I'm not getting what I want from the church. Well, what are you doing? How are you cooperating? What, what are you giving God to work with? There are things that God will do and there are things that God won't do. Don't you know that if Jesus had power, and he did, to raise Lazarus from the dead, Jesus had the power to roll the stone away. Yet he didn't do it. He said, no, you all do that. Roll ye the stone away. And after man did his part, then God did his part. I want to know, what part are you doing? What part are you playing in your spiritual development and growth in the Lord? Praise the Lord. This is a powerful picture of intercessory prayer. Moses went up to stretch out his arms. His outstretched arms with the rod in his arms symbolized his appeal to God. So Moses go up and Moses understood that this battle will be different from the battle that we fought with Pharaoh. With Pharaoh, we didn't have to do anything but leave when the Lord said leave. When we got to the Red Sea, all I had to do was stretch out that rod that God had anointed. But in this battle, I need some soldiers. You know, uh, uh, watch this. Uh, Fostick said this. Uh, he writes, he says, he never, talking about God, he never blazons his truth 
on the sky that men may find it without seeking. Only when men gird the loins of their minds and undiscouragedly give themselves to intellectual toil will God reveal his truth even about the physical world. It takes work to know God. It takes work to learn something. It ain't going to just drop in your lap. If you're going to get ahead in this life, you have to apply yourself. Will a man say when God wants bridges and tunnels and wants lightning harnessed and cathedrals built, will he say that God will do it himself? No, that's absurd. And that's, that's idle fatalism. God stores in the hills, God stores the hills with marble. But God have never built a pantheon. God have never built a statue. We have to get the, that marble out and work it. See, some things never without thinking. Some things never without working. And some things never without praying. Both elements were operating in our text. Joshua had the sword in his hand. And Moses had the staff in his hand. Joshua went out to the battlefield and Moses went up on the hill. We see a powerful picture of family when Moses went up on the hill. For Moses went up there along with Aaron and along with her. Her was said to have been Moses' brother-in-law. Her was said to have been, according to Jewish tradition, he was Miriam's husband. So Moses, Aaron, and her goes up on the hillside and Joshua with his sword and his band of merry men go out to fight Amalek. The battle rages. The battle is being fought and Moses lifts up his hand, his arm with the rod of God, this same rod that God gave him. You remember when Moses said that he didn't have anything. Moses said to God in Exodus chapter 3 verse 4, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken to my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared to thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is, uh, what is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, God said to Moses, Cast it down. And he cast it down to the ground, and the rod became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. <laughs> and the Lord said to Moses, said to Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and he took the rod and caught it and it became a rod again. God anointed that rod. This was the same rod that Moses stood on the edge on the banks of the Red Sea. And Moses lifted up. The Bible says, God said to him in Exodus uh, 14 and 16, lift up thy rod, lift up thy, uh, lift up thou up, lift, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And Moses lifted up his rod and stretched it out and the land divided. And now we see God telling Moses, Moses says, now I'm standing up here on this mountain Lifting up this rod before God. And uh, when Moses lifted up the rod, uh -huh, another battle took place. Now we see the battle between Amalek and Israel. We see the battle between Joshua and Amalek. But then there was another battle. And that's the battleground of intercessory prayer. Prayer, my friends, is a battleground. Bishop Henry Taylor said, prayer is the peace of our spirits, the stillness of our thoughts. But we also must admit that prayer is wrestling. I wonder, have you ever wrestled in prayer? Oh Lord, intercessors know what I'm talking about. Intercessors are accustomed to praying and they pray so hard until they get worn out. I find that a good hard prayer takes more out of me than preaching does. When you've been on your knees wrestling before the Lord, calling on the Lord. See, some of you never prayed until you prayed through. 
Pray until carnality leaves your mind. Pray until your natural worries leave your mind. Pray until you pray from the outer court to the inner court. From the inner court to the holy of holies. Pray until you find yourself in the presence of God. Have you ever prayed until the worry went away? Good God Almighty, prayer is a battle. And I want you to know that we need to pray harder. We need to fortify ourselves in prayer and pray until prayer helps us with our temptations. And just as Jesus had to, we have to also, because you see, Jesus had his prayer Gethsemane. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus told his disciples, sit here while I go yonder and pray. And it was in Gethsemane where Jesus developed a condition called hermatidrosis. Hermatidrosis is the condition where you, because of anxiety, the blood in the human body begins to mingle with sweat. And Luke tells us in Luke 22, 42 through 44, that Jesus prayed until sweat dropped fell from him like great drops of blood. Just as Jesus had his Gethsemane, life will give us Gethsemane also, where you got to labor in prayer. Could it be that we've sinned and that we haven't been praying hard enough for our unsaved loved ones? Could it be that we've given up on old Tommy, given up on old George, giving up on Susan when God is saying don't give up on them go back to your secret closet and pray how long must I pray pray till the mind change how long must I pray pray till you pray through how long must I pray pray till fear leaves you oh Lord how long must I pray pray till I raise them up you see it's a battleground you leave and you're tired you pray till you pray through and here is Moses he's an old man by now and that old man had been standing out there all day long because according to the text they fought until the sun went down so the battle was seesawing back and forth all day long and Moses held his hands up, his hand up for as long as he could, battling, calling on God. And every time he lifted his hands, the Amalekites would lose. But every time his hands got tired, the Amalekites would gain ground. So it was a seesaw battle back and forth. But thanks be unto God that he had a good first assistant and a good second who were paying attention. They didn't even need any instructions. They didn't even have to be told what to do. They saw Moses struggling and they noticed, why don't you let them see it on the slide? They noticed that Moses needed help. So they got a stone and put it under Moses. Now Moses is seated and you got Aaron and her standing on either side, holding up his hands, interceding, saying, God, give us victory. Lord, help us to win. Can I get a witness? I want to say it's time as never before for us to intercede for each other. Don't just pray a simple prayer, but go down on your knees and say, Lord, help the church. Lord, help the pastor. Lord, help my brothers and sisters. Lord, save my family members. Lord, save mama. Lord, save daddy. And just pray and wrestle and stay right there. Notice Paul, he said that we got to put on the whole armor of God. But after he told them to put on the whole armor, Paul said, now pray without ceasing. You see, you can put it on, but if you don't pray, ain't nothing gonna happen. Moses stood there, lifted up the rod, and God came down, and God took men who had no experience 
experience fighting. God took men who had never been to war and he gave them victory over the Amalekites. And when God gave them victory, God gave Moses instructions. Look at the combination. Instructions and worship. God said, Moses, the first thing I want you to do is write this stuff down. Write it down. Joshua needs to know that every time you lifted your hands, I gave him victory. Joshua needs to know that when you prayed, I gave him supernatural power. So write it down because God knew that the day would come when Joshua would lead. So Joshua needed to know from his pastor that it's not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Yeah, yeah, Lord. Somebody ought to lift your hands and thank the Lord for his delivering power. Have you ever been down? Have you ever gone through? And all of a sudden, everything turned around. You found out that somebody was praying for you. Yeah! Yeah, Lord! You ought to lift your hands and thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. So he says, write it down. But don't only write it down. But I want you to build an altar. Build me an altar and put on my altar. Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Nisi. Somebody shout Jehovah Nisi. Shout Jehovah Nisi. means the Lord is my banner. God is my banner. God is my flag. God is my banner. The banner that I rally around. The banner that I go to war for. The banner that I stand under. The banner that gets me fired up. The Lord. rainbow because if we give them this banner soon they're gonna come for the cross they're gonna come for the Bible they're gonna come for you they're gonna come for me the devil is a liar how many are fired up to fight for the Lord how many will say preacher for God I'll live and for God I'll die what was his banner his banner was the rod. Our banner is the Bible. Our banner is the word of God. Our banner is the rainbow. Our banner is God's instructions. And we ought to stand our ground and tell the devil we have pride also. We're proud to be born again. We're proud that we're saved. We're proud that he picked us up, turned us around, placed our feet on a solid foundation. Oh, Lordy, somebody help me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Banners matter. Banners matter. And the banner, you know why I hung them everywhere? The banners ought to be conspicuous. Your banner can't be hid. Oh, no, no. Better put it out there for the world to see. If you don't believe banners matter, just be a football fan for any team 
other than the cowboys and go out there on that field and stomp on that star. You can do it if you want to. They'll come out there and they will get you. Well, the cowboys didn't down the cross for me. The cowboys didn't rise again the third day. But Jesus, ah, Jesus, Jesus died and he rose again. He saved me from my sin. He is my banner. Say yeah, say yeah. Give him praise, give him praise, give him praise, give him praise. Somebody clap your hands and tell God thank you. Jeremiah, I'm closing this, but Jeremiah 4 and 6, the A clause says, set up banners in Zion. Set up standards in Zion. Jeremiah 50 and verse 2, declare ye among the nations, publish, set up a standard. Isaiah 62, verse 10, the last clause. Lift up a standard for the people. That is, raise up a banner. Banners still matter. Psalms 20 and verse 5. In the name of the Lord our God, will we set up banners? Banners were used in military campaigns. Banners identified. They had symbols that represented the gods and the armies that they identified with. Well, this thing should never remind us of LB, GTQ, but it should always remind us that on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Oh, Lord, somebody help me. Somebody help me. Praise the Lord. What a mighty God we serve. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yes. I'm closing here. But I heard Jesus say, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the eyes of the people and everybody who lifted it, who looked at it, they were, they were healed. Jesus said, the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up. Then I heard him say in John 12 and verse 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. Somebody help me lift Jesus. Somebody help me lift Jesus. Somebody help me glorify his holy name. Somebody get happy with me. Our God, he's worthy. Our God, he's real. Our God is God. Say yeah, say yeah, say yeah, yeah. Woo. I want to hear some praises. I want them to hear you praise him down the street. Let them hear you. Yes! Yeah! Yes, Lord! Do I have anybody here who loves Jesus? Do you love him today? Let me hear you say yes, Lord. Uh, I'm, I'm done. 
I just want to testify. I love the Lord. He heard my cry. He pitied my every groan. As long as I live, good God Almighty, and trouble rise. Lord, I'm gonna haste, hasten to his throne. He saved me. He raised me. He brought me out. He changed me. He healed us. He lifts us up. He's our friend. He's our keeper. He's our God. He's got the power. He's got the power. He's got the power. Say yeah. Say yeah. Hollywood, 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 can't claim it. NBA, can't claim it. The world, can't claim it. Oh Lord, doctors, can't claim it. Mm. Oh Lord. They can't claim what I'm getting ready to tell you. Oh! Oh, the world can't claim it. Mm. Before I tell you, let me tell you this story. When I was at Fedville State University, oh, Lord, I didn't know anything about Mm, Greek life. Oh, Lord. One day I was walking across the campus and I saw some rocks with some writing on it. I didn't know what it was all about. And uh, I sat down on that rock just to take a little break. A few minutes later, somebody walked up to me and they said, are you a part of this fraternity? I didn't even know what a fraternity was. And uh, they told me, if you're not in this group, you can't sit here. I understood what they were saying. And since I had no mind to join, because I was already a part of a group, it was called the family of God. I politely got up and left and went and sat on the bench somewhere. And I never sat on those rocks again. Because even though I didn't join, I understood that I needed to respect that territory. It was there. They claimed it. And I was violating, oh Lord, I was violating their banner. Oh, but here we are today. And the sisters can violate our banner. And we say nothing. The devil is a liar. The rainbow belongs to God. Oh. oh, it belongs to him. Oh, it belongs to him. Leave it alone. You have no right to this rainbow. Hey. Hey, Lord. They can't claim what we can claim. The world can't claim it. The rest of them can't claim it. LBGTQ and the rest of them all, they add, a, they add a different letter every day. They can't claim it, but we can claim it. What can we claim? Our God can do anything. Our God anything uh, he's got the power he's got the power he's got the power he's got the power
healed by it. Our God, well, can do anything. He, he's got the power. He's got the power. He's got the power. He's got the power. And he raised the dead. Ten thousand hungry souls he fed. He got the power. He's got the power. He's got the power. He's got the power. 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 Can I get a witness? I'm going to remind you that we, the God we serve, he's got the power. Sister Cheryl, so good to see you. He's got the power. Can I get a witness? He's got the power. Oh, power, power, power. can do anything oh yeah oh yeah oh god can do anything look at your name and say anything anything won't it heal you won't it make a way? Won't it do it? I've experienced it. I'm gone. I'm through. Can do in it. Worship us, worship him right now as we close. They have no right, you have no right to grab God's colors. You have no right, there's no Bible for it. And churches, pastors, you have no right to be silent. You gotta speak up. Give no ground to the enemy. In biblical times, and it's true today, they get your banner, you lose. People go to war. The man that's carrying the flag, that's an important man. Yes, sir. And 
when that flagpole goes down, even on the battlefield, they stop killing the enemy to reestablish that banner. Oh my, to reestablish that banner. Cause you gotta protect the banner. You, they take your banner, am I right? That's a military man right there. They take your banner, that represents, they they've taken your God, they've taken your heart. And we're letting the world just take our banners. Churches that would not open for worship, open for people to come and get shots. Just take, just, 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 just take your banner. Just, I mean, where, where's the fight? Where's, man, where's the backbone? Where is the, I'll tell you, where is, where is the righteous indignation? Someone told me this the other day. I'm running long today. Someone told me this the other day. Said the trouble with the church today is that it is not troubled by the trouble that society is in. The things that are troubling this world don't seem to trouble the church. Preachers find something else to preach about. Something else to key on. Where in the meantime, we're turning our, our nation and this world into a Sodom and Gomorrah. A, a blood of innocent babies just, oh my, running down the streets. Got black folk in the uproar. Black folk, uh, as never before, we are, we are bringing in idolatry into our churches. You know, they brought, the, they brought in multiple gods into the sanctuary, into the temple. And set up altars. Look at these churches. Churches got fraternity altars. They got BLM, BLM altars. They got the Masons. They got all these altars set up in the church. No wonder they have no power. No wonder they have no righteous indignation. Now they may have a big church. And they may, they may draw a big crowd. And they may do community service. But when it comes down to the raw power of God understanding what the Lord is doing you can't bring in fake altars altars to false gods and have God's anointing you're not going to get no anointing like this pledging to someone else you'll never be able to preach like this no 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 and sustain it for a long time because you're divided we build altars to the Lord only. Amen. We can't have but one banner. We worship at the foot of the cross. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you right where you are. I just feel led to just do this today. I want to pray for my friends who are watching. If you're still there, it's a tough sermon today. So I spent a long time in this message talking and explaining because you need to know why we do what we do. One thing about it, our why makes sense. And it's in scripture. And the Bible is right. The Bible is going to outlast all of us. Don't be bothered by the distractors. They'll soon be dead. Men don't live but so long. Even men that live a long time don't live but so long. We're living to live again. We're living to live again. And if God could anoint Joshua to defeat Amalek, you know God can anoint us to defeat anybody. Because what Moses gave him was a death sentence. You go out there and fight, train fighters. And you got some, a bunch of ex-slaves whose only weapons have been that of a hoe and a rake and a hammer. And they've been picking onion, leeks, garlic, and uh, uh, maids and butlers for the Egyptians for 400 years. And these are your soldiers. Hadn't been trained at all. But God takes nothing yes. and makes something out of it. Now I'm a living witness. 
I'm a living witness that he does that. Because he did it with me. I brought God nothing that he could use. And everything I have, God gave it to me. I showed up an empty vessel. And the Lord did the rest. Now maybe I know some of you, you all had a whole lot God could use. But not me. Every time I think about it, I, uh, I, I, I get emotional. Because every man knows himself. You know what's to you and what's not. Don't have an exalted opinion of yourself. When I think I'm loaded with stuff that God can use, he'll never use you. That's right. Pharisee prayed and said, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like this publican. I fast two times a day. I do this and I do that. God didn't even forgive him. Publican said, have mercy on me, yes, a sinner. God. He got justified. Thank you, Jesus. Humility moves God. Well, I'm, 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 I'm mm -mm. nothing but a child of God. Jesus made me who and what I am. Jesus, as we culminate this month, God, I saw signs in stores that they were having a, a pride ride. Today, bicyclers all over riding for pride. Well, God, we had a pride ride too because you sure blessed us in service. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And, and Father, what we ask of you is this we ask that you put that same anointing on us that you placed on Moses, that you placed on her and Aaron and Joshua. For all of us have to contend with our Amaleks. <clears throat> we all have our Gatsimines. Pull us in, Lord. Help us even the more to labor in prayer. Mm -hmm. We make a, a commitment to pray more to pray longer, to seek you, Lord. Starting in the home, in our private prayers. Get on your knees. Don't be in such a hurry. Spend some time before the Lord. I hear the Lord speaking. Tell them, tell them if everything's all right in their house. Tell them to spend some time praying for someone else's house. For it may be all right in your house, but your neighbor's house might be falling apart. Well, intercede for them. Labor for them. If your, your mom is doing good, somebody else's mom is sick. If your, if your children are saved, somebody else's children are lost. There's always somebody. There's always somebody. There's always something to pray about. Oh, God. Our church, Lord. Bless our church. Keep our church. Keep the members. Keep their minds sharp. Keep them engaged in the name of Jesus. We come against that spirit that would cause to drift away. Oh God, I ask you, oh God, to put fight back into many. Some COVID has robbed them of their fight. God, restore them with a fighting spirit. With a fighting spirit. Don't be afraid and don't be ashamed. Preacher, I'm ashamed. I hadn't, I, they scared me. I hadn't been back since. And I, I want to come, but I want nobody to look at me funny. Just don't worry about how they look at you. Just come on to church. Amen. Just come on and get back in to God. Hallelujah. You ain't in satisfied watching on stream. You're no more yourself. That's God calling you. You need to come back. Come back in person now. The Lord watched out. And you, your staying away from church ain't what kept you. Because if that was the case, then I wouldn't be here. Because I didn't stay away. 
and many others and these mothers didn't what kept you was the grace of God the goodness of the Lord ah hallelujah and I hear the Lord saying I'm still good and I still have grace and I still love you so we draw nearer and father according to Exodus chapter uh, number 15 you identified yourself with warriors you said in your word that God is a man of war every soldier ought to be proud Hallelujah. everybody who served in a uniform everybody who's been on the battlefield everybody who served male and female you know you ought to be proud because God likened himself to a soldier. God is a man of war. I never read where God says that he's a preacher, but I read where God said, God is a man of war and said the Lord is his name. God give us all a warrior's mentality, a fighting spirit, a fighting spirit. Revive us where we won't get tired, where we won't get scared. Oh God, oh God, great man of war. Make us men and women who fight in the name of the Lord. We will not be deterred. We will not be intimidated. We will not be afraid. We will suffer our ostracisms and criticisms. We will take it as a badge of honor, as proof of the presence of your glory, as your word describes. And now I ask you, Lord, in my clothes, to heal in here. Heal those who are streaming. Somebody's going through something, Lord, that doesn't have very much to do with what I preached about today. They're facing some dire circumstances. God says I have not forgotten about you. In the name of Jesus. The Lord touch you right now. The Lord heal you right now. The Lord deliver you right now. Oh God. Move in that home. Hallelujah. Move in that family. Move oh God. Move. Move. Sometimes after we finish praying like this, that's why people coming back, you have to come in and you don't come in and set the tone. You wait to see uh, where the leader is because when you pray like that, I feel strength drain. And sometimes when you're trying to recuperate, people come in with a lot of noise, but they don't know. You're spent. You ain't got nothing. You get to recuperate because you've been battling. I'm telling you right now, God's passing out victory right now. We, we labored in prayer. God's passing out victories. God's passing out victories. Receive yours. God's passing out victories. At the expense of some, God heals others. God's passing out victories. In Jesus' name. 